I think there's three very important thanks are in order. First of all, to uh, Tim, Tim Montgomery for chairing it. Secondly, for David Cameron, Bannerman and his team for organising it and for inviting me. And I must give a special, uh, special thanks to Media Intelligence, who very kindly have organised some slides for me at, at the uh, very last minute. And thank you very much to them. Now, these slides are not quite Channel 4, but they may be quite a lot more accurate. Uh, <laughs> Now today, I, am, you, I have the honor to be UKIP national, national Spokesman on Trade, and although what I'm about to say is not specifically party policy, not every sentence and, uh, and, not every sentence and uh, semicolon, it is nonetheless um, our, uh, our, our policy. So I'm first of all going to tackle four falsehoods, and then I'm going to present three truths. But before we go any further, for a bit of background on what happens in other parts of the world, here's the North American free trade area. And I draw your attention to two basic facts. UK exports to the European Union are up to 45% of our total exports. As Ruth Lee said earlier on, that is going down and is in secular decline. And the really informed among us here will, 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 will mention the so-called Rotterdam effect. So the 45% is, is probably overstated. It's probably more like 40%. But that's not really the point I'm about to make. Mexico exports 70% to the other countries of the North American free trade, free trade area. Canada, it's over 79%, virtually 80%. Now, despite the 70% and the 80%, no serious person can be found to say that Mexico and Canada should, because they have that proportion of exports, go into a political union. They can't even find a Miliband brother to say that. <laughs> and I would also draw, draw, draw your attention to the bottom bit of the slide. There is, of course, no free movement in the North American free trade area. There's no free movement between Canada and the United States, as anybody who watches Pitt TV uh, Channel 11 will, uh, will, will, will be aware. And there's certainly no free movement between the United States and, United, United States and Mexico. There are other ways of trading and trading successfully without being part of a political union. So let me go, first of all, but however, we are talking about the European Union and the alternatives, so that's what I'm going to talk about now. Let me make the first truth. The UK has been a leader in international trade for centuries, long, long before the European Union was even thought of. That's the background. Now let me go to the gigantic falsehood number one that the UK needs to be in a political union in order to be able to trade with the countries in it. So let's look at the figures. And I should say these figures are from the European Union itself, from Eurostat. They are, as it were, the very tablets from Mount Sinai. And this slide shows the trade between countries outside the EU and the EU. And you can, she and you can see the sheer value of this trade by comparison, the value of trade in 2013 of the top 20 non-EU countries with and from the EU was worth more than the entire economy of France. For that matter, it was worth more than the entire economy of the United Kingdom. A country does not have to be in a political union in order to trade and trade successfully, not remotely and not at all. The UK would absolutely not be leaving EU markets when we leave the EU. It is 100% that trade would continue. That all trade would stop is simply not a tenable proposition. It is just not true. The facts speak for themselves, and when people say something else, they are practicing a deliberate deceit on the British electorate. Now, let me go to gigantic falsehood number two on trade agreements. Uh, the assumption might be that a country, notwithstanding what I've shown you, a country outside the European Union has to have a trade agreement uh, in order to, to export. These are the top, top ten exporters uh, from the previous slide, and six of them do not have trade agreements with the EU. And in fact, there's, there's a slide there. This is the, D, the, WTO, the WTO option. Which, was, which Ruth Lee addressed with her, with her customary eloquence early, earlier on. And the point is this. A trade agreement is, of course, desirable 
which I will be coming to later, but it is not essential. And one of the reasons a trade agreement is not essential is because of the fall in global tariffs since 1988. Let's look at this slide here. You don't have to look at the numbers. You just have to, to just see this precipitous decline. And I think one of the other speakers said that the average is about 1%. It's more in motor manufacturers. But let me come there to the next and more important point, which you haven't heard from other speakers. What the EU does have is it has many different kinds of arrangements encompassing trade. Now, I've counted seven of these arrangements. Cleverer people than me, for example, Dr. Lee Rotherham, who counted it slightly differently, has come up with a figure of 15. Now, we've already looked at one, one kind of trade arrangement, which is the WTUSA option, i.e. no trade agreement at all. And now look at some others. It doesn't matter about the terms, with one exception, which I'm going to come to. What matters is that so many different kinds of EU trade arrangements exist. They are there. They are, they are in place. They are potential precedents for the UK. Now, there is one clause that does matter, and somebody should take Dr. Patterson, Mr. Patterson aside and explain to him that both EFTA and the EEA require free movement of people, as you heard from your earlier speakers. So to go through all the aggravation of leaving the European Union and still have free movement of people is not a very attractive proposition for the British electorate, I don't think. But Mr. Patterson is a much better judge of that than me. Now, earlier on, those of you who've been hanging on my every word will remember that I said there were seven different kinds of arrangements, and so far, if you look at the size carefully, there's only been six. What is the seventh? To be in the political union. 28 countries, including, including, the, um, including, of course, the UK. Now, many would assume that a member state of the European Union will always export more to the European Union than a non-member state would. Let's take a look at Switzerland. The only column that matters there, except those who are feeling unduly masochistic at six o'clock in the evening, is this column here. Exports per capita multiple Switzerland compared to, compared to the UK. 4.8 times, 4.5 times, 4.5 times, 4.8 times, incredible 5.1 times in, 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 in uh, 2013, to give you an average figure over the last five years of 4.7 times, over four and a half times, a multiple of four and a half times Switzerland exports per head to the European Union. And Switzerland is not a member, is not a member state, it's not a member of the European Union. And again, businesses do not have to be in the European Union in, all, in order to be able to trade successfully and export successfully to the EU. That is the absolute key point. Now, the only justification for putting up with the aggravation, with the regulation, the, the free movement, and all the other things which we discussed is the concept of influence. Now, I think there's somebody here from British influence, isn't there? Maybe they've left. I'm suggesting that, oh, sorry, uh, we don't have influence here. Um, we're going on straight on to the assumption that you have to be in a large trading block in order to be able to make trade agreements. The slide here shows those countries with which the EU has trade agreements and Switzerland has do, does not. That's column A. You've got Algeria, Andorra, the Central American Free Trade Area, and San Marino. This on B is the countries with which Switzerland has got trade agreements and the EU does not. Canada, Singapore, Canada, China, Japan. It just isn't true that you have to be in a large trading block in order to be able to make trade agreements. And maybe somebody sometime will tell the Prime Minister. And by the way, the other argument was that TTIP, the, the, the UK and US, we should, we've always argued that, that the UK should make its own trade agreement with the United States. Somebody, and he may have been working for the BBC, said to me, well, you're too small a country for the, for, for the, for, for the U.S. to be prepared to, to actually sign an agreement with you. So I actually looked up the countries with which the USA does currently have trade agreements. There are 20 of them there. And the fact is that each and every single one of those countries has a smaller, smaller economy than the, than, than the U.K. So now I'm going to go on to two truths. 
Following UK exit, we as a country would regain our ability to represent ourselves at the, at the World Trade Organization and to negotiate for ourselves our own trade agreements in our own national interest, not hamstrung as one of 28. It's a point that Luthley made earlier on. The second truth is that a, a trade agreement with the EU is not essential in order to trade with people and businesses in the EU member states, the so-called WT option. And the three biggest exporters to the European Union are China, Russia, and the United States. Each one of those, none, no, no, no one of those countries have a trade agreement with, with the EU. It doesn't stop them being the three biggest exports. Nevertheless, in practice, after exit, a UK, a UK EU trade agreement is inevitable, simply because we are the Europeans' largest market. And if somebody wants to be really profound here, the crisis in the Eurozone means that the, de that the demand is, um, in the uh, Eurozone is not liable to increase in the near future. And we have, we're running a very sub substantial trade deficit, a very uh, uh, sub substantial budget deficit, which may be bad for other reasons, but it does enhance demand. Now, as we've seen earlier on, I said the EU has multiple models for trade. So which model is the best for us? Which model does UKIP advocate? Is it EFTA, Switzerland, South Korea? Is it even like Turkey in the European Union Customs Union, but not an EU member? In fact, we are putting forward none of these. What we propose is that the UK negotiates its own trade agreement with the European Union. And this, this, agreement should be tailor-made. And if you can possibly forgive and indulge me in this gigantic pun, that suits our economy. <laughs> That's the best way forward. That's the best option for the future of our country. Thank you very much indeed.